Winning, of course, is important, but honorable participation is even more crucial. The point of the Olympics is to encourage young people to make the best of what talents they have and also to establish a proper sense of pride in our talents, skills and national character and identity. You may be pleased or not, as the case may be. I believe you should know a bit about everything. Not superficially either. And that's why I think acting, why I was thrown into acting. Because it's a way of getting somebody else's shoes, feeling where their corn is in their shoes. And it may well yet be reignited again when the Paralympics start soon. So, there you have it. I am an Olympics junkie. I'm very proud of being a warrior of indigenous of Lagos State. Uh, we own Lagos. We're the most civilized people, or maybe lazy as the case may be, where just being a Yoruba is enough for you to be running the government of a state that is not yours. Because we have people of Shu on your everybody is taking ministerial positions here in Lagos. And they are not indigenous of the uh, of the place uh, because the political uh, uh, structure of Lagos. I think their worries have been too uh, uh, ready to sell their birthright, get money, buy the land, sell the land off, and, uh, and just marry wives. Alausa, for instance, is part of my own grandmother's Kuku farm. The Guinness area, all that, the Guinness area, that's Yalaru, that's my, my paternal grandmother, who really was the Oba of Oba there. Uh, and, and fell in love with uh, uh, a man from Ewututu going to the international airport. And he had to come to Oba to marry her, settle in Oba, because royalty, they don't move. They came to marry her there. Their tombs are there right now as I speak. The first thing they have over a left of Ogba is my country. Uh, so I am, when I say I'm a worry, I am a Monile, daughter of the soil. Lagos was a very calm, cool place in those days. We didn't have indoor farming, as we saw that did. We had no water, we had to go to the, to the corner in the street somewhere where we fetch water and we socialize with one another there. And we didn't know anybody was Igbo, Yoruba or whatever in those days. Because you know our parents were transferred all over the place. My father was an accountant with Nigerian post. No, uh, Marines, the Marines they were called in those days, uh, retired as chief accountant and uh, he was transferred to the east. So m m most of my childhood friends, knew, before I got to Penn, were Igbos. We, we, we grew up in Port Harcourt. My brother was in Uma here. Uh, the, my cousin was in Okrika. We were proper Nigerians. We just knew ourselves as Nigerians then. I was over 10 when we got back to Lagos. By, by that time, I couldn't speak Yoruba. I think one of the reasons why uh, I managed to speak reasonably fluent English is because that was the first language, the other language that I acquired, apart from the Igbo. I forgot all, virtually all my Igbo, of course, but that's how we were when we got here. So I've always been cosmopolitan. Uh, my family's always been cosmopolitan like that. Uh, and uh, we, tell, uh, uh, Papa, we used to walk from uh, Ondo Street West. There's another Ondo Street East. From Ondo Street West to Mount Carmel um, uh, uh, in the East. Cross the railway line and walk down there. There's not a question of going to uh, uh, by bus 
uh, uh, and uh, this phenomenon we have now where you, you, you give your children in the car, you, 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 they have to drive to school and the children don't know anything about walking. And it's a matter of what kind of car they keep. My father had a car, but it was not in the plan that anybody took us to anywhere. And we never thought that that was uh, ultraviolet, so to speak. So that's it. We walked to, uh, to the school. But one thing, enduring memory for me was that when we went, by 12 noon, 12 noon 1 o'clock when we were coming back, the sun would have uh, risen to, to its zenith. So my mother used to give us hats to wear, which has stayed with me all my life. Anybody who knows me will know that wherever I go, I'm going to put a hat on. It is not fashion. It is not uh, uh, whatever it is. It is not modern anything. It is what I grew up with me. And so when I went abroad, it was cold there. And it made, it made sense to put a hat on to keep warm. So uh, uh, wearing, covering my hair, my hair had been, it's how I was brought up from here, you know. You, d you dress from, from your neck to, to, to your toes, long flowing dresses or whatever, gowns, and you put a hat on. So that when we're coming from school, you do not get sunburned, you do not get sunstroke, uh, you were looked after, you remained cool as you walked back home to school. That's what my mother did to us. I had two brothers, our dad then, the, the eldest, uh, was uh, for years our representative at ILO in Geneva. He was the director of the Ministry of uh, Labor, uh, the latter fragile. He's, he's dead now. So it's only three of us now, my elder sister, my brother and myself. And I'm the baby of the family, you can imagine. <laughs> I wanted to be a lawyer. But my main concern is to have a skill with which I could earn a living. And if I could learn to type, I went to Igbe on Sunday. And the typewriter I learned to type with is there. So I learned to type because if I could get employment as a typist, I could earn a living. I left home with a child, with that man. It's going to be 65 years this year. I left home and his father died at the Lalupon train disaster. And for some reason I felt that it was my responsibility to train this child, to bring him up. It hadn't occurred to me that you could get married and the husband can take... I've ne for some reason I've never grown up with that kind of thing. I had this responsibility on my shoulder that I had to get a, make a living and look after my child. I hadn't looked in the future that I might marry somebody else. And then when the opportunity came for me to marry somebody else, since I was living a dead-end life here in Nigeria, I took it. Because hey, when you traveled to make, a, to, to make yourself, your life better, you studied. So I thought, well, I would go. Before then, I'd been going to extramural classes. That's where I first met Professor Ayubusheye. He was one of our lecturers at the Extremura. Years later, we, we connected. And he used to call my husband from life at my consort. <laughs> I was going to carry on with the journey. This journey has been going on a long time. I was going to carry on with this journey. And I knew the only way to get there is to make something of myself, which was to study. It didn't matter to me whether I'm an engineer or to study to make a living. So I started learning to type here in the evening school. Somewhere around Laka Papa Road, there was a uh, typing class in the evening. And then, why, the reason why I believe so much in the law in the natural law, in the force, let me say. There is a force guiding our lives. There is a force. And then one day I just received a letter saying somebody wanted to marry me in England. And I thought, uh -uh, I'm, a, I'm on a dead end journey here. In other words, 
when you want something, when you first take the first step, don't sit down feeling sorry for yourself. You take the first step to help yourself. I think the universe takes nine steps to meet you and carry you through. So I've always been a self-help person. Uh, even my book is about self-helping yourself. It's very interesting, the theme of my book. It's not accidental. Every help those who help themselves. Right? I took the first step and then I got this letter from nowhere. Saying I heard that, you know, you lost your husband. Because I was made to marry before, uh, at a very early age. I was married to so his father. But my mother said, she's too young, she's not going anywhere. I'm not a very canny woman, wise woman. So, but I wasn't going anywhere fast. So I said to my mother, I've been invited, this, this is a letter, I don't know him, but he says he wants to. You see the kind of risks I take? I go to marry somebody I never met before. Because I think you can work it out. Because my overriding concern is that yeah, if he offered me that, he was obviously, it turned out he was looking for scholarship, if you see what I mean. I will work as send him to school. I did. It didn't matter to me. I didn't worry about that. Quid pro quo. He helped me out of uh, my own personal hole. How old was I then? 17, 18. I said, well, fine. And he had bought the wedding ring, he bought everything. It was straight for they came to follow me here. They came to knock at the door and anyway my father didn't want me to go. So there was another bruhaha about that. Begging everybody to eventually I and I first told my mother, I'm not saying there's no future here for me. And there appears to be a future for me beckoning. Didn't know how it was going to go, but this is it. So I grabbed it and I got married over there. And I think the following week I was I sort of for uh, I've sought out some nice school. I've joined typing class and Pittman's College, Pittman School, shorthand, and I started doing all this. I eventually went to to Pittman's College, Roehampton Road. So I have many qualifications, darling, but they're not glamorous, but they are what I am. They're part of the tapestry of my life. They make me what I am now. Uh, these little, little courses I took to open up the world for me, to see a little bit more clearly the path to where I'm going, I don't know, but know that they make the journey easier. And so my husband said, you must give this up. You must give your work, your journalism up. You must stop all the studying. You are studying this, that, and the other. You know enough. Go and use them in the world. You know, that's why my husband's with that 28, going on 30 years. He's still my husband. He's still the love of my life. He's still the one person who knew me. Who, who knew my wandering spirit? They recognized it. They recognized my wandering spirit. And they recognized where I was going. I call him my Indian Gabriel, sorry. And when he finished his work, when he set me on the road, he left. It's because I recognize what the universe did in my life. The force took my life. This force we don't know, we don't see. And shaped it. And sent people who will form me like a piece of iron. And mold me. Just as when I was working in the civil service, people would come, have you read this book? You'll be out of Ubakaya and Taiwo, I think you should read it. Are you going to see that exhibition, Taiwo? They don't know me. That's my colleague. 
they broadened me, they took me and broadened me like this and stretched me. And then Tom came into my life. Talk about being multidimensional. What my husband said, you're multidimensional, you have to you have to concentrate. We know you are multidimensional. We know you this him talking to me. We know you're multidimensional. We know you're multi talented. But you have to concentrate on this one because this seems to be your calling. And he knew that I wasn't even aware of it. So you have to give up all of these things. Now I know you're, uh, you're earning money and everything. You have to forget this and concentrate on this. If it's the money that you're earning, I'll endow you so you can concentrate on this. So I decided I'd better go train myself. What do actors do? What do they learn? How do they learn? Learn it. So I went to the City Literary Institute first. Please learn to play the guitar, try to learn to play the piano, and try to learn acting and voice production and everything. It was a good move. I spent a fortune on myself voice teacher, singing teacher, not because I wanted to be an, a singer, but because when you, when you train musically, it does something to your voice. You hear the sound of words, you have the musicality of words and all that, you know that. Then finally I went to go for a school of music and have my professor in acting, in voice, in music, and then I just carried on. So sometimes when, when I look at my life, I never dreamt it. It's not a dream. I never dreamt it. I rather think about it as you can't hide talent, and it doesn't matter what the color of it is. And I think that's my greatest strength. That's really my, that is the point of my success in life. That I did what I did. It's irrelevant whether it was surrounded by whites. They thought that you should do it. And they're not thinking that you are black. And so I'm, I'm awed by my own life. By how it's, it's worked out. Thank you.